Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. It's a pleasure to be with you here today to conclude your retreat with a talk on e-sainthood, how we can be Catholic in this digital age. I'll begin this talk by introducing myself. My name is Jada Puthamana. I'm a secondary school teacher. I teach English and history and have done uh, for the last three years. Um, it's, been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Like every good talk, we're going to start with a prayer um, because I hope that there's something in this presentation um, that touches your hearts and your minds, um, so we'll begin. Um, I'd ask that you all close your eyes and bow your heads. Lord Jesus, I pray for the young people gathered here today. Um, I pray that as they listen to this presentation, um, that the truth that you want to share with them touches their hearts and their minds. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, ideally we would be doing this live, um, or uh, I would have preferred actually meeting with you all so we could interact. Um, unfortunately, such are the times. So, I have two questions I'd like you to instead reflect on. Um, the first being, what digital tools have you used today? Now, on this slide I've got um, an image of a young girl with a backpack. And in that backpack she has a mobile phone, she has a laptop, and she has an iPad. Um, now all of these devices use Wi-Fi, um, or if her Wi-Fi isn't working, it would use her mobile data. Um, and I'd like you to think, how many of these devices have you actually used today? I'm sure that you've used your phone at least once today. Um, I hope, uh, because you've been in a retreat the whole day, um, there's been less tech in your life. Um, mind you, you're probably watching this online, um, so that's a digital tool that you currently have in use. The other question that I have for you is, which of these social media apps are you familiar with? 
Um, do you have a Facebook account? Do you have a Twitter account? Do you have Instagram, Snapchat? I hear that Facebook's an old thing now, um, and Instagram is is the new latest thing, even though it's been around for a little while. Um, do you play around on TikTok? Have you got a YouTube account? Um, and what do you do with that YouTube account? Do you actually make content? Do you share content? Do you write comments? Um, all of the apps that you can see here, all these buttons that you can see here on the screen, they're all considered social media apps, including LinkedIn um, and Reddit, um, if you've been on Reddit before. Now, all of these digital tools and social media apps that you're using are so much a part of your day-to-day, -day, right? Your world has normalized digital interactions. Your generation, I should say, has normalized um, digital interactions. You're part of um, either Gen Z, so you're a Zoomer, or you're part of Generation Alpha. So if you're part of Generation Alpha, it means that you were born in the early 2010s. Yeah. Um, now, with both of these generations, we have individuals that researchers are calling native, sorry, digital natives. Yeah. Meaning that you have been brought up in a culture from the get-go. Um, of, of digital use. Um, this is so different to the generations that came before you, including mine. I am technically part of Generation Y. I'm not much older than you, but my generation was the last to experience, in one sense, um, a more analog, sort of normal childhood. Um, your childhood would have consisted from the get-go of being um, photographed on iPhones, of um, having family videos um, shared on laptops, and having your life sort of smashed on social media pages by a parent um, or a relative. Um, a large amount of your own time, and I'm making a generalization here, but a large amount of your time is spent online, um, especially now um, with the coronavirus doing what it's doing, with lockdowns being quite widespread. Um, you find yourself spending more time than ever online, yes, accessing the materials that you need to continue your education. Um, you would also access the internet in the day-to-day -to, -day to socialize, perhaps to do a bit of online shopping, or otherwise, um, to simply have some fun, to play some games, to fool around on YouTube. Yeah, we've all, we've all done that, we've all been on YouTube, and because everything's hyperlinked, you know, we'll start with a video of a cat or a dog sort of rolling around a little bit, and end up in a different part of YouTube, um, sort of watching a trailer for a film, yeah? Um, it's very, very normal um, for you in the day-to-day -to, -day to use quite a bit of um, the internet and the digital tools at your disposal. Now, in the midst of all of this, um, in the midst of the sort of traffic and the busyness of the internet, um, more and more young people are actually finding themselves lost and overwhelmed. Now, I'll touch on this in a bit more detail a little bit later on, um, but essentially what we are discovering, what a lot of researchers are actually noting, is that more and more young people are expressing um, this sense of being overwhelmed by the world around them because they don't feel that their voices can be heard above the din, above all of the traffic that occurs in the day-to-day. -day. Um, like I said, I'll expand on this a little bit later. Now, what do teenagers have? I'm talking about you here. What do you have to deal with that previous generations did not? Now, because of your exposure to digital technologies from a very young age, it's meant that dependencies or otherwise addictions develop from quite a young age to the point where you might not even recognize your behavior as being an addiction. Yeah? An addiction in very simple terms is a dependency on something. And I say a dependency in sort of a light sense because um, if you're dependent on something, it means that you can't do without it. So think about your phone. How many minutes can you spend away from your phone? How many hours? How unthinkable would it be for you to be away from your phone for so long? Um, what's your reaction when your mobile phone's about to die? It's at 1% and there's that terrifying image um, of the battery symbol um, in its very, very last leg. Um, on red, yeah, because it's about to go. What is your feeling when your phone is about to die? Um, if you're going through all of this, um, or you've gone through this in the past, then I'd say that you actually have an addiction to your technology. 
Um, like I said, these dependencies, because they might have grown from a very, very young age, are probably things that you don't consider addictions, because they're not traditional ones, but in addition to that, um, it's probably a way of life. Um, which brings me to another point. Um, the way that we live our lives because of digital technology has changed so much over the last 20 years or so. More and more, despite the fact that we are as interconnected as ever and we live in a very globalised world, um, we are sort of shutting ourselves off from the rest of the world, um, creating our own little bubbles where our family and our friends are the only ones that exist um, and we forget that there's a world out there and there are people out there that are suffering greatly. Um, and this is part and parcel of, I think, the digital world that we live in. Um, uh, you might know this personally or not, um, but technology also has a bit of a dark side, especially the internet. Um, over the last 20 years or so, there are so many materials um, that are especially sexual in nature that are more accessible than they ever were before. Um, and here I'm going to refer to pornography, um, which is readily accessible for people as young as age seven. Um, and there are other materials as well that we just, we, we don't think of because they're not traditional forms of pornography, like fan fiction, um, that actually act as gateway materials um, that lead to certain addictions, once again. Um, now, finally, um, because of how technology has so affected um, the way that uh, we live our lives, our sense of reality, you know, becomes warped um, because of all of this involvement, yeah, with this digital world. Um, I'm going to refer to social media here when I talk about how teenagers are feeling more anxious and depressed. Um, this is something that your generation is struggling with more than ever because of the standards um, of life that are posed on social media websites. I mean, I'm sure you've had the experience of jumping onto Facebook and seeing a post from your friend. And they look so happy. They look so ecstatic. Their, their life seems picture perfect. In reality, you may very well know that that's not true. But your first automatic reaction is to actually compare yourself to that image that your friend has online. Okay, no matter how artificial it is. Um, so those feelings of anxiety, of depression, of unworthiness are becoming more and more common. And it's becoming even harder to actually extinguish once it is there. Um, issues with anxiety and depression can go as far into adulthood. Um, so it's so important that if you're struggling with any of the above, whether it's anxiety, depression or addiction, that you seek out help as soon as possible um, because help is available. Um, and these are unfortunate byproducts of living in a technological world. Now, um, having shared all of that with you, because technology, specifically the internet, seems like a very scary place, um, what does that mean for us living as, as chaste, faithful Catholics? Um, my other questions to you are this. Is the answer to actually cut technology out of our lives? Is, is that the solution? Um, and is that even possible or practical? Now the answer to that is no. And here are a couple of facts that I want to share with you. Number one, our world is becoming increasingly digital and will become even more digital in a hundred years. I mean, a hundred years prior to this century, um, we had lots of science fiction writers like H.G. Wells um, imagining all of these machines um, in this futuristic world that they had dreamt up. Now, we don't have robots in the same way, but we definitely have um, kind of the genesis of some of those ideas. They exist now. Um, there are sort of robot-like appliances that we use. Um, so you can imagine what our world is going to look like in 100 years. It's not going to become more analog. It is going to inevitably become more digital. Um, I wonder what our homes are going to look like. Our cars have already changed enormously, yes? Like Tesla's developed um, a, a driverless car, last time I heard, and there are also driverless trains that are also running in parts of Asia, which is really cool. Um, the other thing is that you need to be digitally competent and literate to seek out jobs, because again, that's where our world is headed. There are lots of jobs that are going to 
going to be created over the next 20 years or so because of developments in technology. And so you need to make sure that you can compete in that job market. Um, you also need technology to access your education. So it's so important that you're able to be digitally literate. You cannot cut yourself off from this world because our world is this and it is becoming even more so digital. Um, my last point um, is that you need to um, teach yourself uh, certain technological skills to make yourself independent. Um, 20 years ago, okay, if I didn't know something about my laptop, I'd have to call up an expert. Yeah, I had to call up an expert to try to get my laptop fixed. Not anymore. Yeah, we have certain skills that we've either been taught at school or that we've learned online that we're able to use to actually help ourselves. And it means that you don't, A, feel so helpless, and B, you don't actually get taken advantage of by other people um, who might take your technological ineptness um, and manipulate it to their own end. Now, I hope that I've painted this picture for you that digital use is not a black and white issue. Yeah, because there is a good and bad here. Technology itself isn't inherently bad either. It was never intentioned to be bad. Yes, well, as communication technology has developed over the last 20 years, as we developed all of our digital tools, they were actually designed to help communication. They were designed to make jobs that were traditionally a lot slower and um, faster. Um, yes, has it swallowed up some jobs that previous, previously sorry, existed? Absolutely. But has it made our lives a lot easier? Absolutely, and there's no denying that. Right? Um, for the first time in history, we're able to communicate with people wherever they are. Even in some of the poorest parts of the world, there are cell phone towers and there are mobile phones that are available. Yeah, so it means that people aren't stuck out in the middle of nowhere if that's what ends up happening. Um, we can even visit certain places that we've always dreamt of going to um, that financially we might not, never be able to meet. Like you could go and visit a tomb in Egypt right now if that's what you chose to do. Um, and the internet generally is this beautiful place that you can access to learn so many wonderful skills. Um, so if you're wondering why I have um, the beautiful Mr. Sean Mendez on my slide and have for the last minute or so, it's because Sean Mendez um, actually learnt the guitar using YouTube tutorials. He accessed a YouTube tutorial, I think it was on the A Team by Ed Sheeran, and that's how he learnt to play the guitar. And right now you look at him, he's this extraordinarily successful person, um, and it's, it's, it's mostly self-taught. Um, it was something that he took upon himself to do. Um, he didn't look at what he didn't have, he used the internet to try and grow um, the natural talents um, that he recognized he had. Now, um, this brings me to this beautiful idea that you are a remarkable generation. You, you're capable of so many things. You are more digitally literate than previous generations and that means that there are so many possibilities that you see that previous generations cannot. Um, you're also equipped with skills, as I mentioned before, that were previously elite, they were inaccessible. Um, now, almost anybody can become an expert in a particular subject um, because of technology. Um, social media applications and generally the accessibility of most technologies that we use mean that you can create content that you want. Um, and that will allow you to have a voice. And that's a really, really beautiful thing. I can't say that, that was the case 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. People from all different walks of life can share what they want about the world. Um, so I suppose with digital use, because there is a good and a bad to this, it is so, so, so important that when you access technology, you put certain rules in place about how you're going to use that technology. Um, I was watching an interview um, quite recently with Russell Brand, who's had a bit of a checkered past, um, but he had this really beautiful notion that from the very, very beginning, you need to make sure that you put some boundaries in place about how you use a piece of technology. Because inevitably, whether you're the strongest person in the world, whether you have the strongest will, um, inevitably, anything that's really, really good, that tastes good, like cheese and, and sugar, all right, eventually, 
you will find yourself dependent on these things because of how good they feel. Um, that rush that you get when you have something that you really, really like um, is so common when you use technology. It's so common when you actually use um, social media. Your endorphins really do get a hit. So it's so important from the get-go that you use sets and boundaries in place to protect yourself. I know, that seems pretty incongruous, doesn't it? That rules are there to actually protect you. But it really does. It is there to protect you so that the thing that you love so much is not misused or abused, um, that you actually use it as well as you should. Now, I got touch distracted there, a bit of a side note there concerning technology and your use of it. I want to bring back that idea of you being a part of a generation that is so remarkable. This is an article that I found in The Guardian, which is a newspaper, and this is an opinion piece from a 20-year-old in Essex, which is a part of um, the UK. Um, and this young woman, quite remarkably, talks about how she feels so overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day of her world. She's so overwhelmed by the poverty that she sees. She's so overwhelmed by the destruction that we're causing to our natural world. She's overwhelmed by the amount of people who are suffering from mental health issues. Um, but what's her response to this? Her response is, so I'm going to just read the last part of this out for you. Though some are certainly apathetic, there are growing numbers of young people who know that change is necessary and change is going to come. This keeps me going in the morning when I feel insignificant and sad about things in the world. If we each focus on our passions and our skills, we could be a remarkable generation. And those words I believe in so, so strongly. Not just personally, but because there are individuals in our Catholic family who have lived to this very idea. I'm referring, of course, to Mr. Carlo Acutis. Um, you may or may not recognize him, either by name or picture. Um, he was a young Catholic gentleman. He died when he was um, 15 years old from leukemia in 2006. Um, he was an early adopter of the internet. Okay, so he died in 2006, meaning he was using the internet sort of the tail end of the 90s and the early 2000s. And this is when YouTube was just starting. This is when Google really started to step up its game, yeah? Um, the internet was really revolutionized in the 2000s. So the fact that Carlo, at the very beginning, saw the internet and thought, this is a wonderful resource, this is extraordinary, I see so many possibilities here, it's a really extraordinary thing. Now, moderation is always key, and I did mention this earlier, yes? Um, Carlo recognized this, yes? He saw the good in the internet, he saw the good in the digital tools that he was using, but he also recognized that it was important for him to moderate his use. Um, that being said, let's talk a little bit about Carlo. He was a typical teenager like you. He loved his soccer games, he loved his video games, loved good old Pokemon and Mario Kart. People still playing that nowadays. Um, he liked making and sharing videos, especially on YouTube, of his dogs and his air guitaring, his singing, and he loved his Nikes and his jeans. It's a really remarkable thing to see a saint like this, um, who is ordinary in the way that all of us, I guess, sent, I, I guess, sorry, are ordinary. We don't have these extraordinary stories of, of suffering necessarily, um, but Carlo, Carlo was just like all of us. Um, he loved God above everything else. He had such a deep Catholic faith. It wasn't necessarily um, a, a second personality that he had. It was who he actually was. Um, so he would limit himself to one hour video game playing every week. He attended daily mass and he would minister to the poor. It was a really, really beautiful thing, and he would do that on his way to school, on his way back from school. He would give the homeless things. Um, I think these are all things that we're capable of. These are all practical things that we're all able to do. Um, so apart from, I suppose, the last part of his story, which is that he died, yes, of leukemia, and he offered that up to God, um, Carlo was as, as ordinary in the same way that so many of us are ordinary. 
So what does he teach us? He teaches us that you can become a saint in this day and age. You don't have to be a sister, you don't have to be a priest, um, you don't have to have this extraordinary story. Um, you just need to love God. Um, what else did Carlo do that can teach us now? He, he taught us that you can use the skills that you have to glorify the Lord. Um, Carlo taught himself computer skills so that he could develop these videos. Um, he developed a beautiful website um, documenting Eucharist and Marian apparitions. Um, that website's still available if you'd like to actually check it out. Um, this is how he spent his time. This is how he spent his skills. Um, so Carlo's teaching us here that you don't have to shun the digital age. Yes, do you need to protect yourself? Do you need to moderate? Do you need to put boundaries in place? Absolutely. But that's so the joy of the internet is not taken from you. Um, it's so you can use it in the best way possible. Now, what would Jesus do? I know, we, sometimes we ask ourselves that when we go about life. We go, oh, what would Jesus do? Well, what would he do if he lived in this digital world? Yes, he would, of course, see all the suffering that people are going through. Um, but would he use those digital, digital tools? Absolutely. Yeah? If you reflect on what Jesus did in, in the Gospels, long, 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 long time ago, long before digital tools, he met people where they actually were. He traveled, he was a comfort to those on the streets, he told people parables so they could understand the truths that he was trying to share with them. Um, so I think he would use digital tools because he'd know that that would be one of the best ways to access um, a person, especially a person who feels unseen and unloved. Um, they don't put themselves out into the world necessarily. Um, so posting something, you know, sending an email, that might very well have been Jesus' thing. So the words of the gospel that we hear when Jesus says, go out into the world and proclaim the good news to the whole of creation is so true. It is still true today as it was all those years ago. And I think what he is calling you to do here is to become digital missionaries. Um, missionaries always, digital missionaries. Now, I, just before I leave you, I'd like to um, give you some practical suggestions if you're inspired um, or if you've suddenly got this zeal um, to use the internet and do something wonderful and extraordinary with it. Um, not stopping you, do that straight away. <laughs> um, share Bible verses with those around you. You'd be so surprised by how a single line of word from the Bible, um, how that transforms a person's day. Um, it might be exactly what that person is looking to. Um, create a blog like Carlo did. Document different aspects of Catholic living. I have a friend who started a blog. Um, it's called Craving Graces, if you're interested in checking it out. Um, she is a young woman, an Austin lover like I am. And she documents different aspects of Catholic living. Um, mass, rosary. Um, she's this beautiful voice when she writes. And if you've got that quality, um, if you love telling stories and you're a little bit funny and um, you've got um, a, a different sense of humour, um, then perhaps writing a blog is for you. Subscribe to other people's content, share if you don't want to create something yourself. Um, join online groups that promote Catholic causes. Find out how you can get involved. Um, there are certain things that you can volunteer for, obviously not possible at the moment, but something as small as changing your profile picture is a way of actually supporting a Catholic cause. Um, so there are little things that you can do um, if you're scared to put yourself fully out there. Um, share the gospel with those around you by actually living it. Show them you are the living, breathing gospel. Um, in fact, Carlo's mother was not practicing Catholic when Carlo was. It's only after his death that she became a fully believing, practicing Catholic again, and it was because of his example. Um, and finally, reflect on the digital skills that you have. See if there's something there that you can use to glorify our Lord. Are you good at making videos? Are you good at making music? Can you sing? Can you dance? Can you write code? Um, if so, think about the ways in which you can glorify God. Um, well, that's all I have for you today. Um, I hope that there was something here in this presentation that touched your hearts, your minds, um, and I will be praying for you all. God bless you. In the name of the Father, 
and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Let us be in silence for some time. Let us place our hearts and minds on Jesus, who is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to help us to pray during this time. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass or whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be a very moment. Our Lord Jesus Christ, it is your great love for us that keeps you day and night present in the Blessed Sacrament, full of compassion and love, waiting for us to visit you. We believe that you are really present in the Sacrament of the Altar. From the depth of our heart, we adore you and we thank you for the many graces you have given us, especially for the gift of yourself in the sacrament. Our Jesus, we love you with all our heart. Now we are in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is before us. Let us adore him. I adore you, bread from heaven. I adore you, bread of angels. I adore you, my Jesus, truly present in the blessed sacrament. I adore you, Jesus, my true life, because you died for love of me. I adore you, Jesus, divine light, because you show me the way to heaven. I adore you, Jesus, divine lamb, who takes away the sins of the world. My God and Savior Jesus Christ, true God and true man, I firmly believe that you are really and bodily present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. From the very depth of my heart, I adore you. Let us sing together. More love, more power, more of you in my life more love more power more of you in my life i will worship you with all my heart i will worship with on all my mind i will worship you with all of my strength for you are my Lord, you are my God. Jesus, we thank you for the gift of our life and for every moment that we live. We thank you for our parents, our family, our relatives and our friends. Jesus, we thank you for the gift of faith, the grace of our baptism the forgiveness of our sins, the gift of receiving your body and blood in the Eucharist. We thank you for the priests, religious and teachers you sent to us. Dear friends, let us remember our parents and pray for them. They are living for us. They are spending their life for the far betterment of our lives. Let us remember our siblings, our parish, parish priests, religious, everyone who all are related to our lives. 
let the lord bless all of them i come before you today and i just one thing that i want to say thank you lord i just want to thank you lord for all you've given to me for all the blessings that i cannot see thank you lord I just want to thank you Lord Our loving Jesus We are sorry for our sins We are sorry for the times that we have offended you Help us to turn away from sin Help us to live more like you every day Dear Lord Jesus We are going through different difficulties in our life. We want to be a just man as Abraham, Noah and Saint Joseph. During this period of crisis, help us to turn away from the sin and look up to you. Make a counsel with you. Receive the directions from you. so that we may live a life according to your word the word of god the real god then send your holy spirit upon us so that in this time we will be the digital saints of this time open the eyes of my heart o oh lord open the eyes of my heart i want to see you I want to see you to see your holy flare shining in the light of your glory pour out your power of love as we sing holy 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 blessed be God blessed be God